You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Was Jesus really raised from the dead? Or was this really just fake news? I'm Darren Storey and I want to help fact check this key Bible teaching. Welcome to the Gospel Online channel. This is one of a series of presentations on an important aspect of the Gospel. If you would like to, you can subscribe to the channel and therefore you can look at more presentations online. And you can also leave comments, of course. So to fact check the resurrection of Jesus, we're going to cover briefly why this is so important. Then we'll examine in more detail clear evidence that Jesus first died and then that he was raised as verified by multiple witnesses. This will include documentary evidence that utilizes the testimony of witnesses, including friends and enemies of Jesus. We will also present the physical evidence available at the time. And then finally, we will examine the key evidence of behavioral change as a direct result of these events. Was Jesus really raised? And why is this question so important? This Bible passage supplies a useful answer. Now you may not understand all this Bible language in 1 Corinthians 15, but you can surely see the point the writer is making. If Jesus was not really raised from the dead, any Bible believer's faith is pointless. It means a believer has no forgiveness of sins which means we cannot be saved. It means that any followers of Christ who die have no hope of life after death. And therefore, rather than being uplifted by what they believe and practice, any Bible believer has every reason to be utterly miserable. This is absolutely crucial then. Not just to ensure that we're not being confused by fake news or caught up in in a conspiracy to deceive, fact checking this claim is crucial to any Christian hope because it's a matter of life and death. But this of course is a cold case. The incidents involved happened nearly 2,000 years ago. However, we can access the case files because they're presented to us in the Bible. Now, if you're not totally convinced that the Bible is a reliable record, then you may want to note that there are plenty of other Gospel Online presentations dealing with questions about the reliability of the Bible and its message. But for now, I'm going to assume that you're staying with me, so let's try to forensically examine what the Bible tells us about the events surrounding Jesus' death and the claimed resurrection. We will see there is a body of evidence, and then, just like the jurors in a court of law, you will be free to arrive at your own conclusions. And we'll begin with the body at the centre of this case. After all, for Jesus to be raised from the dead, he must first have needed to be certifiably dead. The Bible record gives us multiple testimony to the fact that Jesus was definitely dead. There are four different gospel accounts of the arrest, trials, crucifixion, and the burial of Jesus. For speed, we will look at certain records, but please take the time to go back over them in more detail if you still have any questions. Now, some people claim that Jesus' resurrection was a happy accident because he did not really die. The suggestion is that he appeared dead and then somehow he revived later in his tomb, despite the fact that he would have received no medical attention. Somehow he then escaped his burial place and went on to avoid detection by the authorities. Let's see how this stands up to the evidence in the records. So, for example, we're told in each gospel that Jesus was scourged before he was crucified, as you can see here in Matthew 27. If we called an expert witness, i.e. a historian, we would actually find out that many prisoners died in this public flogging that often preceded Roman crucifixion. Now, the Roman senator 
Cicero describes it in some of his writings. And the biblical scholar Alfred Edersheim sums up Cicero's harrowing description of scourging by the phrase, the intermediate death. And Jesus was so wounded and exhausted by the scourging that the records declare he could not carry the cross to his place of execution and a passerby was compelled by the Roman soldiers to help carry it, as we see again in Matthew 27. And the Jews that were involved in bringing Jesus to trial wanted him dead and dead by sunset because of the Passover Sabbath. And therefore they appealed to the Romans to speed up the crucifixion by breaking the legs of the prisoners. This would cause much quicker asphyxiation in those being crucified. But we note in John 19 that Jesus was found to be dead already. Also, we can note that he still had his side pierced with a spear as an absolute guarantee of death. The Roman soldiers involved in the crucifixion would have known their job. They were experienced in verifying death in their victims. And at the same time, we know the chief Jews involved also wanted Jesus dead. And so we're doing everything to ensure that this was definitely the case. In Mark 15, we have the record that it was a surprise to hear that Jesus was already dead and that the Roman governor Pilate questioned this when he heard about it. Note that Jesus was officially confirmed as dead by the execution officer in his personal report. The Gospels also repeat that the body of Jesus was officially released for burial upon a special request. It's there in Matthew 27. Now, normally crucifixion was reserved for criminals, and so the body should have been dumped in a refuse pit. Instead, then, the body of Jesus was carefully and respectfully buried, and the tomb sealed by a huge stone, as we read in Mark 15. So we can see that there is a large amount of evidence that Jesus died, including the testimony of official witnesses like Roman soldiers and the execution officer, Pilate the governor, the Jews at the cross, and also Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Jewish religious council. Can we believe that all these experienced men got it wrong? They all had different vested interests in the undeniable death of the prisoner, except Joseph. But he also examined what is repeatedly referred to as the body when he respectfully wrapped it for burial. Why would such an educated man seal the tomb if there was any doubt that Jesus might still be alive? So all the evidence points to a dead body and that it was indisputably the body of Jesus. But it's even more important for us to establish whether it really was raised from the dead. What evidence can we bring for that far more unbelievable event? Could there have been a mistake with identifying the tomb where the body of Jesus was now laid at rest? We, we read in Matthew 27 that the tomb of Jesus was actually sealed and guarded by Roman soldiers to stop resurrection claims. Notice the motivation of the Jewish leaders was to absolutely prevent any future claims of resurrection. And they applied for official permission to do this. They sealed the tomb and set a military watch for days. Can you imagine that the Jewish authorities would have done this without establishing it was the right tomb or that Jesus's body was still inside? The sealing would have provided visible physical evidence as to the correct tomb and the guards were on view day and night confirming the correct location. So here the enemies of Jesus as well as the Roman authorities provide testimony as well as physical and demonstrative evidence that no human could have interfered with the tomb or the body. Yet they also help to establish that something far more normal, far from normal happened at this location. More than one gospel record tells us that several groups of disciples 
found an empty tomb several days later. Here is one example from Matthew 28. In this record, we note that the first group were female disciples who were coming to complete the proper Jewish customs for burial. This was because this had not been possible on the day of crucifixion or the Jewish holy day since. Instead of performing their tasks with a dead body, they were charged with being the first eyewitnesses to an empty tomb. An angel encourages them to observe the evidence of the rollback stone and the empty interior of the sepulchre. They are then encouraged to witness this location evidence to others and notice that it is also confirmed that they will see the evidence of a risen Jesus when they go to Galilee. In another gospel record, Luke 24, the women's account is not trusted by the male disciples when they give it to them. So several men run to establish the facts for themselves. We can also compare John 20 at this point, which gives us a fuller account, including another disciple, the writer of that record, John. We noted that the women were encouraged to view the empty tomb, and now Peter observes the additional physical evidence of the linen that we are told Joseph had bound around the body previously. We're being provided with multiple witnesses to an empty tomb in these records, as well as other evidence. But could they have mistaken it, as some suggest? Or is it worse, did they make up the incredible account of earthquakes and angels? Surely, it would have been easy to discredit the earthquake claim straight away. People are going to know about that, aren't they? Uh, and the Jewish and Roman authorities, authorities could have countered the other claims, wild claims as they would see it, by the testimony of the tomb guards, or by showing the evidence of a tomb still sealed and containing the body of Jesus. Instead, we read there was an attempted cover-up by the authorities in Matthew 28. The tomb guard confessed what had happened to the Jewish authorities, who made every attempt then to cover it up. This was the very thing the Jews had been desperate to stop, hence an official Roman guard at the tomb. Yet they are so convinced by the testimony and the evidence presented by the guards that they have to fall back on bribery and false reporting. Note that they took time and gathered all the most experienced minds together to discuss what they should do. Incredibly, after such counsel, this was what they settled on as the best course of action. We have to ask, why would they use their story of body stealing if they still had a sealed tomb and a dead body as clear evidence? And why pay out a huge bribe to the guards unless they felt it was absolutely justified in the circumstances? They were even willing to lie to the Roman governor and perjure themselves to cover up the empty tomb. Their statement, <coughs> excuse me, their statement to the guards was to reassure these professionals that they had an insurance policy once the story was out. And this was because a Roman soldier's life would be forfeit if there wasn't any evidence of him sleeping whilst on official watch duty. The guards must have been desperate to allow themselves to be put into that precarious situation and would only agree to this if they felt they would receive guaranteed political support alongside a lot of money. This provides us then with demonstrative and testimonial evidence that something extraordinary had happened. The great lengths they go to, to explain an empty tomb and a, and a lack of a body, shows great desperation, surely. If they'd had incontrovertible evidence to disprove the claims, then they certainly gave themselves time to assess this, to provide that physical evidence. Instead, we see that they rely on false testimonials achieved through bribery. And their decision is to spread a story that presents the disciples as highly organized, competent and courageous thieves, whilst at the same time declaring trained Roman soldiers as utterly incompetent 
and in fact negligent in their duties. In other words, this cover-up is the actual fake news within this account of the events. But of course, this growing body of evidence no longer has a body as evidence. So how can we confidently claim that Jesus really was alive again, truly raised from the dead? With that challenge in mind, let us call some witnesses to the stand who will testify that they saw evidence of a risen Jesus. We've already considered that at least four close disciples of Jesus witnessed the empty tomb. Two were women and two were men. This is important because under the laws and customs of those days, the women's testimony would not have held as much weight as that of the men. We live in different times. But it's worth noting, nonetheless, that any doubters had multiple witnesses to confirm an absence of Jesus's body. But obviously, it was an incredible thing to believe. The physical resurrection of a man, so cruelly and publicly put to death only a few days earlier. How, how could this be? It is understandable that Peter felt he had to go and find evidence to back up the testimony of the two Marys. And, and another of Jesus's closest followers was also understandably skeptical about these claims of a risen Jesus. In John 20, Thomas was rightly doubtful when he first heard the testimony of other witnesses, and he demanded physical evidence that this was the crucified Jesus and not some imposter or worse, some group hallucination. We can especially understand this of a man who was a twin, we're told, and who would have experienced being mistaken for someone similar in appearance. After eight days, we are told this physical evidence was provided to him when he met the risen Jesus in person. Now, up to this point, we're told that these key witnesses had seen the risen Jesus in different locations and usually as individuals or in small groups. We then have a further mass witnessing taking place and in just the place the angel had mentioned to the women at the empty tomb. So in John 21, we see this was in the physical location of Galilee. That's another name for the Sea of Tiberias. And we have those involved named, providing a helpful list of witnesses. If we were to go on and look at the verses from this point, 3 through to 14, the record explains that the Galilean witnessing took place with all the key disciples interacting with Jesus for a long period. Now, if this was then some imposter who had fooled them up until now, this was a long time to maintain a fraud. These men, remember, had spent three years living with Jesus during his ministry. So any pretense would have been seen through during this situation. Again, verse 14 even goes on to state that this was the third time Jesus had provided himself as living evidence that he had been raised from the dead. These men will now become the chief witnesses in the ongoing claim about Jesus being raised from the dead. Here are just a few further examples uh, from others that we could take from the New Testament records. So in Acts 1 verse 1 to 3, the writer Luke puts on record this statement as an official introduction to this Bible book uh, and this book that, that focuses most on the practical preaching of the Christian hope. So notice how Luke highlights that the disciples of Jesus spent 40 days of physical contact with a living man after the resurrection. In this time, they were provided with what he calls infallible proofs. In other words, clear, indisputable evidence of a risen Jesus. This was the period when these men went from being disciples meaning followers and students, to being apostles, meaning messengers and missionaries. Later in Acts 10, we find Peter 
the center of events again. And we can read part of one of his preaching talks. Now he's a missionary. Notice that he, as an apostle, has a, a message to declare. And that as part of it, he says he's a specific witness. But this was not just a witness to the ministry of Jesus before the crucifixion. He also declares he is a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Again, notice there is emphasis on the physical evidence experienced by Peter in eating and drinking with Jesus after the resurrection. And the fact that Jesus had commanded them to preach, which included these central claims about the resurrection. After a longer period, this preaching of the gospel led to groups of believers in different places forming official churches. Some of these received special letters from the apostles that are recorded in our Bibles. One church in the Greek city of Corinth received a letter with a, a whole section dealing with resurrection from the dead. It is a fascinating case study for the importance of Jesus being raised if you have time to read it later. But for now, we'll just look at the key witness list presented as part of the evidence in 1 Corinthians 15. It includes Cephas, that's another name for Peter, the 12 disciples, those who were originally the close followers of Jesus before he was crucified. It then goes on to talk about 500 believers in one place and says most of whom were still alive at the point of writing and could be called as witnesses. And then it lists James and other apostles. Finally, in verse eight, the writer who is the apostle Paul calls himself as a last witness, explaining that this is partly based on the timeline. And then in verse nine, which isn't on the screen, he, he goes on to consider himself as the least worthy witness. Now we'll come back to that point in a short while. So I hope you will already agree that there is a large body of evidence for Jesus being raised from the dead and that this covers different forms such as eyewitness accounts and testimonials, physical evidence, uh, as well as documentary and demonstrative ev evidence. But can we just consider what I think is perhaps the most powerful of all evidence, and that is the behavioral change in certain people before and after they were presented with these other forms of evidence. To do so, we need to go back along the resurrection timeline to examine certain uh, key events before Jesus was killed. Now the arrest of Jesus is torture and execution would have shocked anyone. But for those close followers who had committed to him for three years, it was disastrous. And yet, Jesus had tried to prepare them because he knew it was coming. For example, we have this account in Matthew 16. And Jesus had begun to explain in a high level of detail what was going to happen soon. But we know that Peter resisted this idea completely, as well as all the implications. And Jesus tried to get them to understand on more than one occasion, as we can see by comparing Luke 18. Notice again the level of detail Jesus is providing about these terrible things he knew he would have to endure. And this time he discusses it in the third person, I think to help the struggling disciples cope with the challenging message. But again, we are told his followers completely misunderstood the idea of Jesus dying and rising again. So despite these repeated attempts to prepare them, we find they reacted in a desperate and panicked way as things began to be fulfilled. Mark 14, tells us that when Jesus was arrested at night in the Garden of Gethsemane by a large group of armed men, the disciples of Jesus abandoned him. Now I'm sure we can understand the reaction of the disciples to such a fearsome scene in the middle of the night, and that we would probably feel the same and possibly react the same way. 
as the account of that evening unfolds in Mark 14, Peter, who is repeatedly part of our case notes, did actually follow the, the arrest party. But then he proceeded to deny any connection to Jesus as he is accused of being a follower. And this happens three times in close proximity. Eventually, he loses all control, swearing and cursing at those who were trying to connect him to Jesus. So the behaviour of these men leading up to the execution of Jesus does not present itself as positive, does it? They had failed to fully comprehend the idea of Jesus dying, let alone the idea he would be raised again after three days. And then they had physically abandoned him at his arrest. And Peter had also denied any connection publicly, giving testimony three times that he was in no way associated with the man on trial. These men had been at the centre of traumatic events and they were no longer acting zealously as followers of Jesus. Instead, they were seeking to hide and disassociate themselves. And we do not see this change for days. So it seems hard to believe they could coordinate some guerrilla style raid to steal Jesus's body from underneath the noses of a squad of professional Roman soldiers. But then in Acts 2, Peter is now in the middle of Jerusalem and he's preaching about a risen Jesus, as we can see from this small section of his speech. We need to understand this is only 50 days after Jesus's very public trial and execution uh, at the time when Peter vehemently denied knowing Jesus on multiple occasions. However, now he is prepared to stand up in the centre of Jewish authority, the temple in Jerusalem, and he is now even ready to point the finger at them for causing that death. Not only this, but he is also publicly claiming God had raised Jesus from the dead after they had murdered him. He even goes on to claim that King David from the Old Testament had spoken of this in a prophecy a thousand years earlier. And Peter even uses the tomb of a dead and buried David as part of his argument in verses 29 to 32. And we should note how he finishes this section by claiming that they are all witnesses. Can we see his point? They, they all knew where a celebrity like King David was buried, so they could be called as witnesses that David was dead, if that were needed. But if they tried to do the same for Jesus, and the fact that he was definitely dead, would they find the same evidence of a sealed sepulchre? Could they be the same sort of witnesses? Or were they in fact witnesses to an empty sepulchre? Now, this was the perfect public opportunity for these resurrection claims by the apostles to be quashed, but they weren't. This incredible change of behaviour is recorded repeatedly from this point forward in the New Testament. We can find evidence for it in many places. But why would these former frightened disciples become such bold advocates for a risen Jesus if this was really just fake news based on a hoax. After all, the Acts record goes on to make clear this was a high-risk message that they preached. Here are a few examples. First, we can see in Acts 4, verse 1 to 3, that preaching a risen Jesus led to temporary imprisonment. Then the next day, Peter and others were challenged in an unofficial trial to justify their preaching, as we read in verse 10. But Peter states that his motivation and newfound courage was based on his firm conviction in a risen Jesus. In verse 13, we see how those who opposed Peter noted this behavioural change. The courage and the powerful logic of Peter's message totally amazed his enemies because it was so unexpected, so different from how they'd been before. And the risks are re-emphasised uh, through uh, verse 18 to 21. These were changed men 
Peter and John were now ready to stand up publicly before the authorities and disobey commands to stop preaching the resurrection. And this was in the face of further threats and official intimidation. Then in Acts 5, we actually find them imprisoned again. And now they're brought before the official Jewish council in verse 27 to 30. The authorities had commanded suppression of the message they preached. But Peter's opening point is his need for obedience to God in the face of the clear evidence of the resurrection. Notice that there's an unconscious testimony by the high priest to the bold and the effective preaching these men were now fully committed to because they were filling Jerusalem with this message. Peter goes on in verse 32 saying that as witnesses and being in a court, they obviously needed to speak the truth rather than be forced into silence or to perjure themselves by lying. This provoked the Jewish authorities into planning to kill Peter and the others, as we see recorded in verse 33. Other verses record how these Jewish leaders were counseled against plotting this illegal act by one of their number. But it didn't stop them beating the apostles and commanding them again to stop, as is summarised in verse 40. And what do they do? Well, verse 42 tells us the actual response of these changed men and that it was quite the opposite. Sadly, by chapters six to seven of Acts, we have record of the first death as a direct result of such preaching. This was Stephen who was stoned to death by the Jews, but it was because he definitely believed the message of a risen Jesus and that it was worth preaching and even that it was worth dying for. But now I'm going to call my final witness to the stand. This is the man whose behavioral evidence is the most incredible of all. And this is because he began as one of these men who was so against Peter's preaching. This is Saul. And he's formally introduced to us in the record at the start of Acts 9 through these words. Note how Saul's introduction presents him as the chief persecutor of Christians at this point in time. A, a man with the official commission to arrest any believers and who actually hated them so much that he wanted to murder the disciples. But Acts 9 goes on to record how Saul was then called by Jesus, was actually converted on the road to Damascus. Years later, he gives an account of this as part of his defence in a formal Roman setting, and that's recorded in Acts 26. Just note some of the, of the points he makes in verse 8 to 11. This is a man confessing to incredible negative acts against any followers of Jesus, including being an actual witness against them in trials that would lead to them being put to death. But Saul emphasises his change of behaviour, and he goes on to speak of how he moved from one extreme to the other uh, in verse 12 through to 18, if you want to read that for yourself. For now, we might note how he summarises his preaching message uh, and what he says in verse 22 to 23. Here is the former chief persecutor who had been witness for the prosecution. And now he's standing up and declaring before a Roman governor that he has become a prime witness for the defence. Now, if we had time to examine his many letters in the New Testament, we would see that Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, builds his preaching, his teaching, his practical Christian advice around a risen Jesus. He, of course, is the writer of 1 Corinthians 15 that we looked at previously. And remember, he declares himself there as a witness of the resurrection. Paul's testimony, whether verbal, documented, or behavioural becomes an astounding 
body of evidence all on its own. And we can add to that this. Look at what he endured so that he could preach a risen Jesus across the Roman Empire, as he puts on record himself here in the, a second letter to the Corinthians and chapter 11. Who would endure so much and make such sacrifices for a hoax, for fake news? Would one of Jesus' friends have done this, let alone a, a previously sworn enemy, a persecutor? Would they be ready to embrace such things as this unless they were totally convinced and if there had been evidence against the resurrection, this man had been on the inside of Jewish officialdom during that key period. So he would have known if this was really fake news or not. He of all men could properly fact check this claim. These are some of his last recorded words in 2 Timothy 2. We can note that right to the end, the resurrection of Jesus was still his key message as he awaited his own execution for believing and preaching these things. He declares that it is a message worth dying for because it is his hope and his reassurance. So as we draw our presentation to a close, hopefully you will agree that we've seen that there is a large body of clear evidence from his enemies and his friends, as well as the impartial parties involved, that Jesus definitely died, but also that he clearly rose again from the dead. The enemies of Jesus relied on intimidation, punishment, imprisonment, and execution to try to suppress the message of a risen Jesus. They did not use any physical evidence. Instead, they created fake news to counter the testimony of multiple witnesses claiming to have seen a risen Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus was factual as far as the disciples were concerned. And this was because they had witnessed that he had been raised. And they'd done so on multiple occasions, in different ways, different circumstances, different locations. And it completely changed their attitudes convincing them to preach openly throughout the world, even when persecuted and killed for their faith. The clear evidence even caused the conversion of a chief persecutor, turning him into a chief advocate for a risen Jesus. I believe there is so much clear evidence that Jesus really was raised. But this is more than just the reopening of a cold case, isn't it? As the converted apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So where, whether Jesus really was raised really matters. Next week then, God willing, the Gospel Online will present what the resurrection of Jesus really means. And then we hope that we'll be able to present even more evidence for why so many people changed their lives to believe in a risen Jesus and why it continues to be so important to preach a risen Jesus to others. Thank you so much for staying with this video, and please take the opportunity to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. May God bless you as you continue to consider the life-saving message of the Gospel. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, 
Most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at btf at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen.